Right, I will turn it over to Robert Dudley to introduce our Hey everybody, speaker. I'm really pleased to introduce my PhD student, Leanne Lewis. Leanne is a, uh, a derived, is a native of the Great Hudson River Valley. Let's hear from the New Yorkers. Right, and appropriately enough, she went to Cornell for her undergraduate degree and then came here uh, for a PhD. And Leanne is broadly interested in, in vertebrate bone and also in avian biology. And the mo I would argue that the most compelling unresolved question in all of vertebrate biology is how do we how do you evolve a hovering vertebrate? Okay, it's a question that's been me for many years. And with apologies to Rory, this is a hummingbird wannabe. Okay, <laughs> you know every hummingbird is a perfect hovering animal, but um, in the old world sunbirds and the uh, Australian Austronesian. Um, Honey eaters are all kind of, you get a whole full spectrum of interesting flight behavior. None of them really crack the sustained hovering that uh, hummingbirds can engage in. So we have some, some very interesting work on um, bone uh, structure in relation to origins of hovering, true hovering, sustained hovering behavior in um, some birds. And we also think if you go to the collections here, there are bones of birds from all over the world. And of course, they're all kind of static constructs. They aren't, they're dead and they aren't really changing shape. So we think, as a non sort of verb biologist myself, we think of bone as kind of a fixed thing. But in fact, they're highly plastic, labile structures. So the other component is on different, of Leah's dissertation is on various time scales looking at actually how bone changes functionally. So we do a lot of aerodynamics and kinematics, just sort of external behavior of flight in vertebrates, but equally of equal interest are how the bird bones are changing on, in response to variable aerodynamic loading, migratory behavior, and then as we've got some very interesting studies of uh, calcium um, of ex absorption and re-expression re for use in egg lay laying. And this is a very important problem in uh, a species called Homo sapiens and the phenomenon of osteoporosis where you have bone fragility as a function of increasing age. So there are a bunch of different angles here. Without further ado, I'll let you know, talk about her dissertation. Awesome introduction, and thank you all so much for coming out. Um, I felt really supported by the NVZ throughout my time here, and I think that the turnout we get at <coughs> finishing talks like this really demonstrates how supportive the community is. Um, and I also want to call out some of the people that came here from other places that are not VLSB and actually like moved their location here. So thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Um, and it's all of that support is part of what has brought me here today, which is to tell you about. Two of my favorite things, which are birds and their bones, and um, you might be wondering, Robert told you a little bit, but like, who cares? Like, why study bird bones? Like, people bones are cool. Um, well, bird bones are actually really interesting because bird, birds actually feel some of the largest strains on their bones out of any vertebrate. So they go through some really extreme things. And the way that they do that um, is by, most of us actually put our bones in what's called compression or bending, so we like walk and we put weight on our bones. Um, but birds actually put torsion on their bones, and the way they do that is when they flap, there's a center of pressure that's sort of like behind their bones, because it's on their wing, and that sort of like twists their bone around like that. And torsion's not really something that bones are really good at dealing with, so that's part of uh, what made me really interested in um, bird bones. Side here, so most of us deal with, with this force or compression, um, but birds actually go through torsion. And the highest torsional strains that birds experience actually occur in this kind of scenario where they're taking off and they need to produce um, a bunch of lift with their own weight. The study was actually done on pigeons, which is why I put one of my favorite birds up here. Um, and so in order to adapt to some of that, those torsional forces, birds have done something that you guys have probably all heard of, which is to make their bones hollow. So we as mammals have somewhat thicker bone here, and then we have marrow on the inside. Birds actually don't keep their marrow inside of their bones. Instead, they, they basically put it elsewhere. And this allows them to expand the radius of the bone and make it wider on the inside. So they may have actually some of the same amount of bone, but it's sort of spread out, and that makes it a little bit stiffer. Um, so I was interested in studying how birds <coughs> adapt over time, different time skills, as Robert said, um, how they change basically the shapes and the amount of their bones. So you can change, birds actually can change the shape of their bone over their lifetime in a couple different ways. They can sort of expand the radius here, like you see in this bone, but they can also sort of morph it and make it kind of longer rather than more circular. And so this kind of shape 
would be slightly better than the shape at bending and sort of this up down axis. So they can change the shape in this way. Um, they can also, and we can do this too, increase the bone mass. And this is what this would look like. So you actually just increase the amount of bone here. And this can be a little bit stronger because you have more bone, um, but it also is heavier. So there's some trade-offs there. Um, I'm going to be talking about two different types of bone, just to review your basic biology. I mean, here's kind of a human femur, but you have two different types of bone. One is called cortical bone, and that's the like compact bone that looks, this is sort of what a cross section looks like. Um, and that's usually in the middle of your long bones. And then there's also this bone called trabecular bone. Many of you learned it as spongy bone. Um, it's also called cancellous bone. And that tends to be at the ends of your long bones and also in some of your shorter bones, like your vertebra and your skull kind of looks like this. There's like a bunch of little struts. So I'm going to be talking about that a lot. Um, so I was interested in understanding how bone changes during all these different time scales. And um, so I looked at basically three different uh, projects, which is why I kind of use this figure here. Hovering flight. Now, if you just recall, I said that when birds take off, that's when they feel some of their highest torsional loads. Well, hovering is basically that. They're trying to produce. This is a form of locomotion where they're trying to stay stationary in the air. They're producing all of the lift with their own body. Um, so this produces very high strains on their bone and is also difficult for other reasons that I'll talk about in a second. And then migratory behavior. Birds that migrate, you can kind of think of them as the marathon runners of the bird world. They put a lot of loads on their skeleton when they migrate. And then finally, egg laying, which is <coughs> the big calcium draw that Robert just mentioned. So let's start with hovering flight. With my subject here, the sunbirds. This is the southern double collared sunbird. And hovering flight is challenging not only because of that, the strains that I mentioned, but also because it requires extremely high mass specific rates of oxygen consumption. And of course, the sustained birds that we know best are the hummingbirds, and they have adapted to these really high, <coughs> this high oxygen consumption that's required to hover in several different ways. One of the most well known is that they have. Mass versus wing length, they have relatively long wings um, compared to most birds, um, and this allows them to produce all the lift that they need. Um, in order to make moving those long wings, well, perhaps in order to make moving those long wings a little bit easier, they have shorter humeri. So, this is if you move from swifts down to the hummingbirds, you see that their humeri, their bone right here, gets really short. They also have short legs, um, perhaps to reduce weight and because they don't them as much as other birds, um, and they have some constraints on their mass. So we see a lot of different ways that hummingbirds adapt to this difficult mode of hovering, but the rest of the birds do. Lots of birds are capable of hovering transiently. Um, do they adapt in any way to this difficult behavior? Um, but the other thing is that um, hovering is a little bit different in other birds, as we have well known, and I've shown this before, but this is how a hummingbird flies. So you can see there's symmetric lift production in both downstroke and upstroke. But in contrast, this is a video of a Palestine sunbird hovering in a feeder, and you can see that they only are producing lift in their downstroke, not in their upstroke. So they're using a much different mode in order to sustain their hovering flight. Um, so how does this influence the morphology? We actually, I'm talking about sunbirds today, but there are several other birds that are nectar feeders and are also known to hover, including the flower peckers, um, the, the honey eaters, and also the honey creepers. And, why that I'll be talking about the mm -hmm. sunbirds, the nectar in a day, um, because they're really interesting in that they, of course, eat um, nectar, but they, but they vary in how they do it. So some species and different populations within a species, depending on what flowers are available, will either perch or they will hover in order to get their food. Um, so I looked at a bunch of different morphological metrics to see what's going on to make them so good or not at hovering. Um, including the body mass, tarsus length here, tail length and wing length, kind of just these like basic ornithological measurements. Um, but I also used calipers to measure the lengths of these various bones. So this is the wing, so the humerus, the ulna, carpometacarpus, as well as the widths. Um, and also I looked at both widths, so top to bottom and forward to back to look at if there's like an asymmetry in the shape of the bone. And then I also used <coughs> microcomputed tomography to look at some of these internal measurements, such as the thickness of the bone and a better measurement of how much material is there. Um, so I looked at all these different things. I also did an ancestral statement construction. For those of you who are interested, I did four different models. I did um, 
if you can only evolve hovering or if you can only evolve not hovering. I also looked at equal rates, so both directions of both hovering and loss of hovering. And then I looked at different rates of, different rates of gaining or losing that behavior. And then I did phylogenetic least squares to account for the um, phylogeny to look at and included both mass and the interaction effect of hovering as well as the phylogeny. So this is um, a phylogeny that was hopefully provided <coughs> by Rory. And this is the ancestral state reconstruction. Um, the legend seems to have disappeared. But the open circles are birds that we have not known to hover. And the closed circles are species that we have seen incidents of hovering. And what I want you to get out of this is just that there are many different o origins of both the loss of hovering and also the gain of hovering. So you can see there's a couple losses here. Um, but there's some gains right here. And the other thing that's interesting about it, about this model, is that you can see that from this really tiny pie chart that more of the pie is black rather than white. So we actually think that, that some birds may have been just as capable of hovering at their origin as they are now. And what this also results in is that there have been actually more losses of the behavior rather than gains. So there's about 30 gains on this, this picture and about 17 losses. Um, so that's all really interesting, and it makes it a really good uh, group to study to look at how hovering behavior evolved. Um, so then here's some of the comparisons of the external morphology. All of these charts are going to have the birds that we don't know to hover in the open um, circles, or open bars, and then the hoverers <coughs> are in the closed um, images, and then there are males, females, and species averages have the different colors. Um, Males and females were, the, the, the non-hovers and the hovers did not differ in mass, but um, the males tended to be just a little bit heavier than the females. This is something we've already known, but I did find it with the literature review that I did. Um, <coughs> what about wing length? So here's um, a plot of the log of mass versus wing length. Um, for most birds, the, the slope of that plot is about here, but for hummingbirds, it's steeper, as I said earlier. They have longer wings than you'd expect. Where are the sunbirds? They're pretty close to most birds, so they're not evolving um, very steep, uh, a very steep slope. So the wings are not longer than you'd expect, and the hoverers do not seem to be different than the non-hoverers. They're all kind of just mixed in there. <coughs> so in terms of wing lengths, sunbirds are a normal bird. What about tailing? Um, okay, so when I did the literature search, I think that I got a lot of for the males, I didn't get a significant correlation, and I think that's because um, I got a lot of these like really, really long. This is 129 millimeters on like a 50, 50 gram bird. So th these are probably sexually selected um, long tails. So I'm going to redo this analysis for Rory's data set because he has some better data on the sort of aerodynamically effective tails. But in the females, we see here's what you would predict for birds, and it's actually significantly steeper, so they tend to have longer tails than most birds, which is kind of interesting. And then with tarsus length, tarsus length is interesting. Um, this is what we get, and this is what we would expect based on just isometry or just like basic scaling laws, and it's actually a lot shallower than predicted. So sunbirds in general have short tarsi, short legs relative to their mass. <coughs> we kind of zoom in, um, actually, if you look, you can see that the residuals of this line, if you like look at how far away the different lines are from, or the different dots are from the line, you'll see that the non-hovers tend to be above the line, and the hovers tend to be the below the line. So hovers actually are significantly, they have significantly, they tend to have significantly shorter tarsi. I only saw that in the females, not in the males, but you can see that this bar is lower than this bar. So they tend to have shorter legs, kind of like what we see now. So then this is just a summary with all of those things. So we know that the ancestor of, of sunbirds was probably capable of hovering. Um, they tend to lose hovering rather than gain it. Um, and generally, they have um, sort of normal length wings, long tails, short tarsi. And um, uh, the hoverers have relatively <coughs> short tarsi. OK, what about the bones? That's what I'm actually mostly interested in. Um, so bone lengths, as I measured with just like museum specimens and, and um, in museums, tend to scale as you would predict. So they follow that like isometric line here. Um, you can see these, this exponent. If it's following isometry, it should be 0.333, and it's pretty close to that for the length. 
and the width. If you look at the ratio of this dorsoventral or up-down width with the forward-back width, you see that the hovers tend to be a little bit, um, they tend to have like more ovular, I should draw a picture of this, but they tend to have taller um, ulnae relative to the non-hovers, which have rounder ulnae. Um, this was not significant, but you can kind of like see that there's something going on there with the ulna. What is significant is if you take, if you look at a CT scan and look at the internal morphology. So this is kind of a weird metric, but if you correct, this IMAX is basically a, a measurement of strength in bending. So you'll have a high IMAX if you're really good at um, resisting bending forces. And if you take the body corrected residual of that, you see that the hovers are much steeper. So they tend to have really, really strong ulnae. And this is what it looks like in the CT scan, just kind of like a drawing. So you can see that it's a little bit thicker here, and that results in a stronger ulna. Um, and then the other thing you see, which I'm still kind of wrapping my brain around, is that the, the shape ratio of the femur actually changes a little bit. So uh, the ratio of the two different, the perpendicular stiffness measurements um, is actually closer to one for the hovers. So they tend to be like a little bit rounder. And it's something you only see from the, um, from the CT scan. So it's something that's happening internally where it's sort of moving the bone around in order to make it more symmetric. Um, so we can add that to our list of what changes with hovering. The ulna tends to get a little bit stronger, and I guess I didn't add anything else. So they have more rounder symmetric tarsi and then strong ulnas. Um, so it seems like there are a few metrics of hovering in the non in the non hummingbirds, um, and so this is really interesting. And I actually have some data from the honey eaters, Melophagidae, as well as. Um, few hummingbirds as well, because they haven't done any measurements of, hum of hummingbirds in their cross sections in the CT. So hopefully I'll be able to add some more data to the story before I actually publish it. But this is um, what I've got for, sunboard for the sunbirds. And I will now move on and talk about migratory behavior. And I'm going to be using this study subject here, which is the dark-eyed junco, which we of course see all over campus. Um, this is its eastern form the Junco hymalis hymalis, um, but we see them on campus as well. And migratory flight, just like hovering flight, is really hard. And it's really hard for a lot of reasons. Um, the first is that you burn a ton of energy when you're migrating, so of course we all know this. Um, and in or so in order to gain that energy before birds leave, they actually have pre-migratory behaviors <coughs> called Zuganru, where they have this whole sweep of hormones that increase prior to migrating and they increase the mass of both their muscle and their bone and their um, fat so that they have some energy to burn and everything. The other thing that happens is actually migrating <coughs> increases the loads per day on the skeleton. And this is kind of the action that's actually causing things to, um, causing the bird to spend more energy. And what was interesting to me about these two things is that um, in humans, this can cause what's called fatigue failure. So in humans, if, um, if you are, for this is the example that's usually used, if you're recruited to the military and you say you were like exercising before you went to the military and you're like all good and in shape, but then you get there and they put a pack on your back and it's like 100 pounds, it's really, really heavy. So suddenly you're running, but you've just increased your mass by even more than 20%. And what will happen is that people will get cracks in their bone and they'll get a fatigue failure and so they'll be out of commission for a while because their bones are cracked and unable to heal. Um, so what I was really interested in is, is this happening to the birds? And if, it is, if it's not, what are they doing? Like, why are they not getting fatigue failures in VR? So that's kind of what led me to this question. And in order to get some predictions about what the morphology would do, um, what I did was think about what happens to get this <coughs> increase in so the way you get the increase in mass is that you get this whole sweep of hormones, as I mentioned before, including, including prolactin and corticosome. And this change in hormones is caused by changes in day length. So birds sense either the decrease in the day length or the increase in the day length. Um, and this causes a sweep of hormones that leads to the pre-migratory um, behaviors. But what's interesting about this is that there is some evidence that prolactin can cause an increase in vitamin D, and there's some evidence, this is not like super well supported, but there's a little bit of evidence 
suggesting that vitamin D could cause an increase in bone mass. So this could suggest a mechanism by which bone mass would increase in a bird prior to migrating. And in addition, <coughs> adding mass all by itself will cause an increase in bone mass because you need more bone in order to support your heavier body. So here, these are two mechanisms by which we might see a change in the bird's <coughs> bones, and they lead to a couple different predictions, which is what I tested with my data. So the first prediction is that <coughs> if you get this hormonal sweep, you would expect there to be an increase in bone mass just everywhere. So like both at the ends of the bone, with this trabecular bone here, but also in the middle with the cortical bone. So that's what you would expect with the hormonal mechanism. <coughs> with the increase in body mass mechanism, you would expect to see changes in the load-bearing organs, like the, the wings and the femur, but maybe not in some of the other bones in the body because um, they're not bearing as much load as um, the limbs. So these are kind of my two predictions that I wanted to test. And this figure was helpfully provided by a recent um, paper that came out. Um, and the way I wanted to test, so the way I wanted to test that was by using dark-eyed juncos. Because dark-eyed juncos are really interesting. There are um, a lot of different subspecies that have actually been primarily studied by uh, George Barroquo and um, some of the other people who have come from the NBZ. And so I had lots of skeletal specimens to work with, which is super helpful. Um, but the different subspecies are doing different things. Um, you get on the east coast this Junco hymalis hymalis, which will move from my home area of the Hudson Valley all the way up to Alaska, so it goes on a long distance migration. But here we have Junco hymalis pinosis, which just chills out in the Bay Area and doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> just eats and makes sense. Moves on to itself. Um, you get a similar resident subspecies in Pontillus, which is in northern Baja, and then or this subspecies Oregonus, which does do some migration from sort of the Oregon and Washington area up to um, Alaska. And then on the east coast, we actually have another resident in Carolinensis. These are um, presumably an offshoot of the Hymalis group, and they primarily migrate like up and down the Appalachian Mountains. So we have a couple different residents as well as migrants. And then Ikeni is kind of in between the two, and it's kind of like a short distance migrant. Um, so this is what I um, am hoping to study. Unfortunately, I only have data on the two species that I have shown you guys in the past, which is this resident, California pinosis, and the eastern one, uh, pinalis. And they'll be shown in this open for resident and closed for migrant boxes. And so what I did was to look at different metrics of bone mass or bone um, shape and look how they were reflected in body mass as well as migratory status. Um, and I did that using microcomputer <coughs> tomography on the femur and the humerus. And I took two different compartments, as I talked about at the beginning, a compartment to look at kind of the trabecular bone and a compartment to look at the cortical bone. So what did I find? First, we're going to look at bone volume in um, the two compartments here. And what you can see, and this is in the femur, is with mass, the trabecular bone basically doesn't depend on mass. They kind of have like a set amount of trabecular bone. And it doesn't, there's this weird, one weird outlier, but for the most part, they're all kind of in this region here. But the cortical bone does depend on body mass. So we can kind of reject this first hypothesis that I mentioned because you saw an increase in mass in the cortical bone, but not in this, um, in the trabecular bone. So it doesn't seem like there's kind of like a hormonal sweep causing these changes. What about um, this prediction? So for this, I looked at cortical thickness, which is how thick this ring is here, this ring of cortical bone. And I looked in the humerus and the femur. What did I find? So in the humerus, you do see some dependency on mass and it looks like this. In the femur, you, you also see a dependency on mass, but it's actually different depending on whether you're a resident or a migrant. So the residents have relatively wide femurs for their body mass, and the migrants actually have relatively not so wide femurs for their body mass, which is pretty weird. And what this results in is, at, is something interesting, there, um, which is kind of a difference in their relative strength of their humerus related to their femur. This is what it looks like. So if you go from resident to migrant, you get a more sturdy humerus, but you get pretty much no change in the femur 
And what this causes is a significant increase in the relative bending strength of the humerus relative to the femur. So migrants have relatively strong humeri, which makes sense. But it does kind of counter this argument because if you're getting an increase in bone mass, I mean, the birds also walk on the ground, so you would expect the femur would increase in mass to the same amount in all of the birds, especially in the migrants. So what else is going on? Um, well, I'm trying to, that's part of why I got all those other subspecies is that I kind of want to explore this a little bit more deeply. Obviously, this has the disadvantage that I'm studying different subspecies, so I'm not actually looking at, like, a bird before it migrates to after it migrates, which would be the ideal study. Um, so I want to look at more subspecies to get an idea of that. Uh, but there could be some mechanical forces going on here. So first of all, the fact that they're you know, loading their bones more per day, that doesn't usually have a big effect on bone, but it could. The other thing is that they beef up their wing muscles a lot before they migrate because they're using them so much. And there is some crosstalk between muscle and bone. So it could be that the increase in the bone volume could be caused by muscle mass could be some different things going on. So I want to add all these other guys. So I have a couple more residents, a couple more migrants. I want to add those. Um, but just to summarize, it did not look like bone mass changed under the suite of pre-migratory hormones, nor under the change in body mass. So it could depend on some of those wing mechanic mechanisms that I was talking about. Uh, but to gain a better picture, I'm adding a couple more subspecies. And I'm really excited to check out that data. All right, so finally, egg laying in this individual here, which is the zebra finch. Um, egg laying is super interesting. It's extremely challenging. I, this is a chicken egg, not, not a zebra finch. <laughs> 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 um, uh, yeah, so they, this eggshell in a chicken requires about 18 grams of calcium, right? Birds can get the calcium that they use for that from two sources, so they can get it directly out of their diet. So we know that even birds like hummingbirds will eat things like insects, so they can get more of these minerals um, that they don't get from their nectar. Um, but the zebra finches will eat more seeds and more diversity of things, and they'll eat, they, we put like oyster shell domestically, we put things like oyster shell inside of their cages so that they have more calcium. So they get 75% from their diet, and then but then the rest of it has to come from their skeleton. And the reason is that there's, it is basically depends on um, calcium dynamics in the bone. The bird just needs to keep a high amount of calcium in its bloodstream so that it can create the egg quickly. And it just can't get enough from only um, increasing its diet. So 25% of the skeleton doesn't sound like a lot, but that's actually about 4.5 grams of calcium, which just back of the envelope calculation can be about 5% of skeletal mass. That's kind of a little bit of an overestimate, but it's still quite a bit. It would be like losing several like and wing bones if it all happened in one place. So that's, that's significant. <laughs> and um, if you're interested in human biology at all, this is even more interesting because uh, when women breastfeed, they lose a lot of calcium out of their skeleton, but in one month of, of breastfeeding, they only lose 1% of their of the mass of their skeleton um, due to calcium loss <coughs> in the blood. This is all happening in one day. Like, this is a big, what's going on here? Like, well, how are they doing that? How are they doing that and not, presumably, maybe they are at greater risk and they're just not moving around, but if they are keeping their skeleton strong, what are they doing? How are they doing that? Um, so one thing that they do is that they actually add some bone to their body um, before they before they start to lay an egg. Um, so they store calcium inside their skeleton, so on the insides of the bones in what is called medullary bone. It's also bone, it has some different mechanical properties, but it's basically full of calcium, just like bone is. And it's inside. So I'm gonna show you a picture to get an idea of what that looks like, and this is gonna kind of like cut away into the image. Um, this, these are two CT scans taken from the proximal humerus of a zebra finch that was not laying and a zebra finch that was laying an egg, or was about to lay an egg. So let's just cut away at that. You can see all these like spicules of trabecular bone here, and then on the right, there's just kind of a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of extra mass. And this is what it looks like. So there's like a lot of extra little like spicules, is what they're called in the literature, of bone mass in the form of medullary bone. So how does this influence 
skeletal morphology, we see that there's an increase in the spicules and things like that, but like, how does that influence the whole bone morphology? Does it change strength? Um, does it do anything to the bird other than um, just sort of exist and then disappear? Um, and in order to get some ideas about what might be changing, I looked at, um, or I thought about what goes on when a bird is um, created, creating an egg. So um, this is how much estrogen is in the bird's bloodstream over the number of days. Zero is when the bird ovulates, and minus 10 would be 10 days before. So at 10 days before, the ovary is inactive. This is, what, this is the, the little ovary here. These are pictures that were taken by Terry or someone else in the prep lab. Um, with your handy dandy ruler here. So this is an inactive ovary, it's just kind of a blob. When the ovary becomes active at something like seven days before ovulation, um, you see that it has differentiated. So there's a lot of different ova or eggs kind of pre-existing here. Closer to the time before ovulation, you start to see something really cool that you only see in birds, which is this hierarchical structure because birds can only lay one egg at a time. They develop them at different rates. So the egg that's going to be laid first is going to be developed first and then you see like this hierarchy of smaller and smaller little eggs um, that are getting ready to be ovulated and then at zero days they ovulate and then about 24 hours later the egg is laid and six of those hours are spent developing the albumin and the yolk and things like that but 18 of the hours are spent in the eggshell gland where the eggshell is built so it takes some time um, so I and, and what's interesting about the, this estrogen um, curve here is that uh, we actually think that the um, that when birds are making the the medullary bone, it mostly depends on the amount of estrogen in the bloodstream. So there, there's actually been some literature showing that the osteocytes, the bone, or the osteoblasts, the those cells that build bone, actually have like little places on on them where they take in estrogen, so they can see that, and then they start building right away, which is not something that we have as humans or as mammals in general. Um, so I wanted to look at what happens over time. So first, ovary inactive, so presumably no medullary bone, um, about seven of those birds. And then I looked at when the ovary is active, so somewhere between like five and one day before ovulating. And then right as they ovulated, so I actually took those birds about like six to eight hours after they ovulated um, based on seeing that they had laid in before they're going to lay another egg. Um, so I have, this is my data set, so I'll get some more. Um, and then again, I took microcomputed tomography to see what's happening in all the different parts of the bone. Um, and just in case you're curious, this is what it looks like zoomed in at super high resolution. Um, this is using synchrotron-based imaging. Um, this is a bird when, a female when she's not laying an egg. Um, I, I didn't include a reference picture, but what's What's interesting about this, because this bird probably has laid an egg in the past, is that there's actually a lot of vasculature here, a lot more than you usually see in birds, um, and that might be a result of previous um, ovulation and previous egg laying, so that's kind of interesting. But that's when they're not laying. Um, this is when they're laying, and you can see it's just different. Um, <laughs> there's, an expansion of those vascular cavities, presumably, as well as some spicules on the inside. Um, these smaller dots, in case you're curious, I mean, you probably can't see them in the back, but the smaller dots are um, osteocytes. So maybe those are changing in volume as well. It's hard to tell. All right, but anyway, what happened, What actually happens to the bone um, surface area and volume? So the first thing I'm going to look at is surface area, and the reason I'm interested in that is that an increase in surface area means that there's more places for the osteoclasts, or the cells that eat away the bone, to eat away at bone, and thus get calcium for the eggshell. So you would expect there to be an increase in surface area when they um, create this bone, this medullary bone. And I'm going to look at two bones, so the humerus and the femur, and then at the two places, so trabecular bone and then cortical bone. All right, and then it's going to be pink is inactive, green is active, blue is ovulated. So you can see that when you go from an inactive ovary to an active ovary, in pretty much all of the locations except the mid shaft of the femur, you get an increase in surface area. It makes sense because there's medullary bone, so you go up. But you don't really see a difference between 
the bird when its, act, when its ovary is active and when it has just laid an egg. So we don't really see a difference in the surface area there. What about volume? Same plot, just with volume. And this was really weird to me. You see a difference in the humerus, so there's an increase in volume from the inactive ovary to the active one and to the, the egg-laying bird. But for the most part, volume doesn't actually change that much, which is really weird because they're, you'd think they're absorbing some of that volume to make an egg. So what's going on there? Um, well, if we look at the, the CT scan, we can get kind of an idea of that. So if you look closely, you can see that there's a pretty thick cortex here. But when you move to the egg-laying bird, the cortex seems to get a little bit thinner, and it's sort of like pulls away at that bone and kind of like puts it out as little spicules inside the bone. And so it's, what could be happening is that the bird is actually kind of like moving the bone so that it has more surface area. It's kind of like spread out and it's able to access that when it's laying the egg and absorb it. Um, so this is interesting. And the other reason that this was interesting to me is that this is not what happened when I, I took males and I implanted them with an estrogen implant. and. You can see, yes, it's quite okay. Um, and you can see that what happens is that there's just definitely an increase in, in bone volume. Um, there's a significant increase in bone volume when you put the estrogen implant in, the bird just immediately grows bone. But we don't see that for the females that are actually just creating estrogen on their own and laying eggs. So it seems like in the real system where things are kind of operating as they supposedly should, there's actually a trade-off. So the bird is not necessarily totally increasing its bone volume. It's kind of like reshaping the bone. So there must be some other um, <coughs> mechanisms other than just estrogen going on. Because if it was just estrogen, you would see just this overall increase in bone volume. Something else that was interesting to me was that I didn't see a difference between surface area and volume um, between the birds that were preparing to lay an egg and the birds that actually had laid an egg. So I was kind of curious as to what was going on there. Um, and what it, it does look like there are some changes are happening, but what it looks like is happening is that they're changing the structure of the bone a little bit. So this is the structural model index, it's something that we use in bone biology to describe like the shape of the trabecular bone. So the shape can be close to zero, and then it's these like plates here. You can see they're sort of like sheets that it's hard to see through. Um, or if you have a high structural model index and you have rods, you have like struts of bone like this. And what's happening when you lay an egg is that you're making your trabecular bone or your spicules of medullary bone much more rod-like. And it makes sense because you go from like a sheet that's like sucked in and it becomes a rod. But what's interesting about this is that the literature says that this shape of bone is actually better mechanically. It's stronger, it helps the bone it helps the bone stay much stronger. So it, it looks like perhaps just by resorbing their medullary bone, they're actually kind of like making their bone a little bit stronger, which is interesting. All right, so this is just a quick summary of everything I've spoken about in the last um, section. So the active ovary increased the surface area, but not the volume. And this actually contrasts with, as I said, males that were given the estrogen implant who increased both surface area and and this could reflect that there's a trade-off between the bone mass and not, not so much the calcium need, but the need for that surface area so that the bird can resorb the bone prior to egg laying. Egg laying by itself did not reduce the volume, um, but another thing I mentioned is that I only took them within the first four or five hours of the 18 to 20 hour egg laying process, so it could be that I just didn't see anything yet. Um, but it did change this shape of the struts, and this is one thing that I am <coughs> hoping to answer by doing some finite element analyses. And I believe that that is all I have for you. So many people to thank. As I said at the beginning, this has been a process that would only have happened with um, the support of both the MDZ, which I sadly did not, did not find a picture of, so that's why you guys are not up here. But, um, with the help of the NBZ and with all of my friends and family, um, this is me and my sisters, my, sis, my identical sister, my fraternal sister at her um, wedding. This is Ashley, I had to torture you. Um, Mary and Tony and um, some of my friends. <laughs>
yeah, so I'm just, I, I'm really grateful for all the support that the MVZ has provided, um, <coughs> and um, especially uh, Carla and Terry, who have had to sit with me in the prep lab and prep things a lot. So thank you so much that you did the Dudley Lab, my dissertation committee, everyone, and I will take any questions. Um, are able to regenerate throughout an organism's lifetime, such as the lung. You see that there is a very organized way of bifurcation mm -hmm. in the way the lung grows. And I'm wondering, um, when you see these rod-like structures, so when they become more rod-like within the medullary bone, do you see a type of structure to the branching? Like, is it planar, orthogonal? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, so the question was, is there a structure to the, the shape of the rods of the rods in the medullary bone, and I don't actually know the answer to that, so I haven't been able to look over time, but that's something I could answer with my data by looking at um, different bones that have been developed at different times. Uh, thank you. It's a good idea. Yeah? About the bone volume not yeah. uh, decreasing, do you think it's, can you get it from your CT scan data? Can, does it max out the dynamic range, or can you get an estimate of density or something? Right, I can get an estimate of density, and density could be changing. Um, there are some disadvantages to using the CT to look at density because um, the size, the amount of bone kind of like biases how, what the density will be. So I can look at density, and that's why I didn't show it. Um, if I can recall, I believe the density didn't change significantly. I think what's happening is less that like calcium is being sucked out of sort of a rod and more that the whole bone is being out. Um, but that's, yeah, that's a good question. I could look and see if the density is <coughs> is changing. I don't think I can see it in the resolution I'm operating at. I would have to, like, get it. It kind of seems resolution. like it must have to come from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's probably a small change, and I just, I mean, it's happening throughout the body, so it's probably just so small that I didn't sense it in that, like, six-hour period. Yes. So the, during egg laying, the circulating calcium levels in blood goes way up, right. so it's coming out of the bone. Mm -hmm. Does the increase in surface area in the female bone help to maybe increase that ability to get the calcium out yeah. of the bone into the blood? Is that that's what I'm thinking, that's because true. there's more surface area for the osteoclasts to yeah. absorb. what that's about. And that's, so that's probably, that's actually like predicted as to the mechanism as to why they actually make the medullary bones if there's increased surface area to yeah. absorb okay. bone and make is it possible that they're mostly pulling calcium just out of other bones that you're not measuring? Yeah. Like, are there some that are under less strain, so they're maybe more flexible? Potentially. In that way? Um, the femur is kind of the, the bone that is most looked at. So, all, uh, I, I didn't show it, but there was a recent really good paper that showed across all the different species of birds which bones in their body actually create medullary bone, because it's not all the bones. But the femur is one that pretty much 100% of the birds had. The ulna is another common one, although I didn't look at that. Um, so you would expect there to be something coming out of the femur because that's kind of like the most common place where it seems like those things happen. So I was expecting it to see, I was expecting to see it there. Part of the reason I chose the humerus and the femur was that I was expecting it to be maybe less out of the humerus and more out of the femur because the humerus is more important for the bird. Um, but it would be interesting to look at I don't know, like a rib bone or something like that that maybe isn't like as important uh, because it's not bearing load. So, yeah. yeah. Are there more bone injuries to females during egg laying? Is there any way you can assess that? I Yeah, that would be a really fun thing to assess. Um, I'm not aware of, of any studies that looked at that. I will say that because I collected these birds um, like while they were laying eggs and they definitely didn't want to fly. They definitely like tried to stay put until I kind of like came up to them and they were like, oh, okay, I have to fly away. So I do think that they have a tendency to not fly um, in order to maybe maintain or like prevent injury, potentially. But, but there are no studies on that that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, so with the Sunbird data set, it was, I think the CT scan where you're showing the hovers were yeah. more yeah. oblong right. overall. There was a lot of variance of the hovers. Have you tried to pick that apart, whether it's associated with older, newer gains of hovering or hovering ability or anything like that? Yeah, that would be a good thing to look at. I did make sure when I took the CT data that all the birds were like a little bit similar so that there was a little bit less variation um, 
like within the species. Um, so it could be that I got kind of like specific groups that like were really hovering a lot or were not hovering a lot um, or were living at, there, there was variation in things like elevation. So there's like a lot of potential ways that that data could have varied that I should definitely look at. Uh, is it possible that the and so also your, your data with the active ovary showed a lot of variance. Uh, and is it possible that like bone production could be, like the rate of bone production could be equal to the rate of bone loss? So you wouldn't see necessarily a difference? That, yeah, definitely. That could be happening usually when the bird is laying the egg, at least the studies that I've seen on the cells or that there's sort of a ceasing of all creation of bone when they're absorbing it. So like the osteoblasts just like become, they change from the cuboid, as we say, to like just being really flat and not operating. But, but that could be happening maybe in other parts of the body. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Before we thank Leanne one more time, I just want to remind all the students who are signed up uh, to come get the teacher evaluation forms. Don't run out, you need to do those. Uh, <laughs> And let's thank Leanne for a great talk.